I'm going to give you a glimpse of the future, a version, uh, not necessarily the version. And I should warn you that it's optimistic in regards to the pace of advancements, but it's pessimistic based on why we need to make those advancements. It's, nine, it's 2061, and I'm now 102 years old. I've chosen to live the rest of my life on this colony ship uh, with a few thousand other like-minded folks, and we're heading toward the planet Destiny, one of the possibly habitable planets that was imaged uh, 20 years ago. Now, it's over 25 light years away, so the living beings on this ship, well, the AIs will still be alive, um, will not be alive to reach that. Our descendants will. But two, it's not the point to reach the journey, but have a segment of humanity living independently. As a matter of fact, most of humanity now lives in colony-type environments, even on Earth, which became a necessity after the environment went unstable. I mean, Earth's environment is still habitable, if you don't mind wild temperature extremes and really violent weather and all those insects that flourish under those environments. Um, but for the most part, these closed-loop life support things has enabled humanity to survive past that point. I thought at first that I'd feel confined aboard these uh, ships, but you know, when you think about it, humanity has been confined on Earth for uh, tens of thousands of years before. And then most people, too, they, uh, they never wandered but a few kilometers away from their house even when they did live on Earth. And we certainly have that much space here. So it's not really all that confining. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's really nice here. I mean, for example, these lush green walls that we have here all over, um, synthetic bio, they're here to uh, help recycle our air. They take the artificial sunlight, use that for photosynthesis, keep the balance between our oxygen and CO2. They even help regulate the humidity of the air. And the part that I also find amazing is that they take dust, which is very much skin cells, and use that as part of their feedstock. But they don't taste good. That's not part of our uh, meal recycling. For that, we have other uh, synthetic bio things to make sure we don't get food monotony. Um, Everything is fully recycled. Well, okay, except our power source. That does need a continual uh, influx of uh, material uh, to keep those reactors going. And th the reactors are the type where they can uh, convert those uh, many materials into uh, uh, fuel. Um, so, you know, to keep the cycle of life going, you do need at least energy. Um, on Earth, it was the sun. But for our spacecraft, or at least these colonies, it's a, a dual reactor. Um, you know, the other thing that's going to be recycled is me. When I die, there won't be a grave. Um, my body parts will go into the whole system where their molecules will be recycled as they need. Now, this brings to mind one thing that I'm still uncomfortable with. I have the option to download my essence into an immortal machine so I can live forever. And, you know, I think that's too much. Um, I mean, I was okay when the era of the, uh, the phone implants and the internet connection implants were a normal part of, of humanity. And I even went for one of those processors that could help me from losing my memory. Um, but, well, for example, when I learned my grandson was doing that whole transhumanism thing so he could do the exoskeleton asteroid uh, prospecting, that was a little bit too weird for me. Um, and for those of you who don't know, if normal human skin exposed to the vacuum, well, the blood boils at the surface and you die in a few seconds. So a few adventurous, uh, well, previously humans, uh, re-engineered themselves to have exoskeletons to not only contain the pressure, uh, but uh, shield radiation and provide thermal control and even claws to make it easier to prospect on the asteroids. And, you know, it's just a little bit too much. I mean, they make good money, but what are those bugs going to spend that money on? But, okay, it reminds me, when my daughter turned 16 and she got her first tattoo, I thought that was bad. It's a completely different ballpark. <laughs> Which reminds me, the one sad thing about this is I won't be able to see my children again. They're on other colonies. And because of the distance between us and the light speed limited communication, we can't have a dialogue anymore. I mean, they can send messages that I can read and I can reply and send back to them but I'll never have that dialogue again, and that, that is something that is hard to take. 
well, and maybe that's why I might try this uh, immortal machine thing. So then I could go visit him and uh, have that. Well, you know, that reminds me, this whole immortal machine uh, thing, with the change of AI that it was coming and what that meant. Well, the first time it really struck me that a change was imminent was on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing, um, 2019, when you had the Apollo landing sites. There were no other astronauts there. As a matter of fact, the moon was covered with rovers, in part accelerated by the Google X Prize, that were taking these fantastic pictures, even with artistic content, semi-autonomous rovers, not fully AI and intelligent yet, um, and they were guided by graduate students back on Earth. So this idea of the elite astronaut corps and whatever, you have graduate students operating remote rovers. And from that point on, uh, most of our space explorations were done by these increasingly intelligent rovers to go into hazardous areas where humans couldn't do. But that doesn't mean there wasn't human spaceflight, because then human spaceflight came for the thrills. First there was the Virgin Galactic Joy rides that started around 2013. And a few years later, you had the Bigelow orbiting hotels, so you could go up there and look down on Earth and, yes, finally do zero-gravity sex. And I can tell you, the challenge is worth it. Um, but also, do allow your enough time because it does take a couple of days of zero-gravity adaptation sickness uh, to, uh, to get over it, but, you know, that's just par for the course. <sighs> well, on these ships, uh, where we do have synthetic gravity by um, you know, physics breakthroughs that happen with the help of AI. Uh, we still have regions where we can turn that off and still do zero gravity sex even at 102 years old. Um, the other thing that reminds me is about the AI transition. Um, there was a fear point that when they got smarter than humans it would be a bad thing, but actually it turned out to be a saving grace. Their intelligence helped us solve these problems, to make these closed loop life supports. And, and the moment that struck me as the pivotal one is when our human militaries tried to use the AI to fight battles, and they just didn't. And they later explained to us in terms that we could understand that they, the human instinct programming, the challenges, the competition, and all that stuff, territorialism, that's for humans. It's not for other intelligent beings. And their uh, motivations came to increasingly improve their knowledge and their efficiency. And they diversified, and they had no trouble with fighting over resources because they could go even to mine things from Mercury and Venus, get closer to the sun for solar energy, and some of them stayed companions with humans to help us with our problems. And that's where, like I said again, that's, they allowed us to do so many mental refinements that humans couldn't do. They were not barred by dogma or by pre-prejudice of possible old solutions. They could cycle through things in milliseconds and do the fine re, fine re find refinements that allowed this closed loop cycle to finally work. And then even helped us solve the physics of other things which led to being able to do synthetic gravity uh, for the crew. And which also is now our propulsion. We don't have rockets that need enormous propellant supplies, space drives that push on the very uh, matter of inertial frames. And they're here on board too, now also trying to help us solve the light speed barrier. And that would be great, because if we can solve that one, I can talk to and possibly visit my daughters again. And the other thing, when we also do that breakthrough, then we can finally seek out new worlds, new life, new civilization, and boldly go where no human or Earth derivative artificial intelligence have ever been before. Thank you.